Take your Bible and open it once again to Psalm 51. We began a journey through this psalm last Sunday morning, a journey that I am calling a journey back to joy. And so if you would take your Bible and find Psalm 51, verse 1, and we'll read these verses. Read these verses of this psalm of David again this morning. If you don't bring a Bible with you today, if you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible there in the pew rack in front of you. And if you'll find page 474, you'll find Psalm 51, verse 1. Again, I would encourage you, if you don't have a Bible with you today, find one there in the pew rack in front of you. Turn to page 474 and you'll find Psalm number 51. 51. And let's read this psalm of David. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation." And uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God. You will not despise. Would you bow your head and let's pray. Would you pray for me? Ask God to speak through me. And then would you pray for yourself that you can hear his words? Just listen. Pray. I'm finding myself at a loss for words. And the funny thing is, it's okay. The last thing I need. Father, let us be still and know that you're in this place. And may your word speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're on a journey, a journey back to joy, because I honestly feel like I'm talking to some believers this morning whose fellowship with the Lord is not what it used to be. 
You're not as close to the Lord as you once were. Your walk with the Lord is not what it should be or once was. And you need your joy back in your life. Several years ago, the Houston Post published some letters received by parents from their kids at summer camp. Listen to these kids' letters from camp. Dear Mom and Dad, I sprained my ankle, I fell out of the top bunk on the floor on top of a flashlight, and now I'm wearing it home. I, I, I don't understand it either. I don't, I don't understand it either. Dear Mom and Dad, camp is just terrible. It's been raining for two days and third base is underwater. Nothing worse than third base being underwater. Here's my favorite. Dear Mom and Dad, pick me up, pick me up, please pick me up. I want you to pick me up. Come now and pick me up. Drive fast. <laughs> Do you hear the fervor in those words? Do you hear the honesty in those words? Did you hear the fervor and the honesty in David's words a moment ago? Have mercy on me, O oh God. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. You see, with fervor and honesty, David confesses his sin before God because he knows that his journey back to joy starts with finding forgiveness. And ours does as well. David recognizes his sin is so serious, only God can forgive it. He remembers that all sin is against God. He realizes only a complete and honest confession will be accepted before his God. Well, I went back to Brookshire's again this week. Beer on the floor all over the store. No, no. If last week you heard me equate buying beer with sin, you heard wrong. If you heard me equate thinking you can hide your sin from God is as easy as hiding your beer from the preacher at Brookshire's, you heard me right. Because you can't hide your sin from God. And David knew that. That's why these words of honesty came forth out of his mouth. That's why these words of fervor came forth. Have mercy on me. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly. Cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God. David knew that you can't hide your sin from God, and he came to God with a complete confession, requesting forgiveness. And that's exactly what he found out of the mercy and grace of God. He found forgiveness. And that's exactly what happens to you and me when we come to God with complete honesty and a full confession. And we ask for forgiveness. We find it out of the mercy and grace of God. He forgives us. So your journey back to joy starts with you finding forgiveness. Recognizing your sin. Not trying to hide it. Completely confessing it. But it doesn't end there. I said your journey back to joy begins with finding forgiveness. But it doesn't end there. But that's where we stopped last week. But David didn't stop writing. There's, there's still more of this psalm. And so we're not finished with the psalm. Our journey back to joy requires another step. So focus your eyes again with me on verse 12. Listen again to verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation. That, that's an interesting, a strange, a weird kind of phrase. It just simply means deliver me from the blood that I have shed, O God. It's a confession of his murder of Uriah, Bathsheba's wife. 
Deliver me from that shed blood that's on my hands, God. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. So, our journey back to forgiveness does, excuse me, our journey back to joy begins with us finding forgiveness, but it does not stop there. There is another step we must take. And here's where we begin our life point this morning. Finding joy calls for service. Finding joy calls for service. Because you see, you must get to that place where you moved from recognizing your sin, not trying to hide it, completely confessing it, and now you're ready to serve the Lord again. Verse 12 says, uphold me with a willing spirit. One translation says, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Make me willing to obey you is the idea. Make me willing to obey you, Lord. It is a spirit of prompt obedience, a spirit that is eager to obey, and that's what is needed if you are to get your joy back. Prompt obedience, eagerness to obey. You need a spirit that is willing and eager to obey God. Then you are ready to serve. Service. That's the response that you make to the forgiveness that God has granted you. And you see, that's where most of us make our mistake. Most of us never go beyond the point of asking for forgiveness. Most of us never go beyond the point of merely asking God to forgive us of our sin. And when we ask, He forgives. And so we think we're done. We think, well, now that's, that's all there is to it. No, to get your joy back, you must move to the next step. And that is a pledging of yourself to serve the Lord. Not in order to receive forgiveness, no. Not as a condition of your forgiveness, no. But you pledge yourself to serve the Lord because you already have received forgiveness. Because you have already received forgiveness, you serve. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. We'll come back to this idea. But I'm talking about a willingness to serve your Lord. That's how you get your joy back. That's why David says what he does in verse 13. Then, then I will teach transgressors your ways. You see David's service, his willingness to serve. I love the story of the old preacher who stood up one day and read his text, Matthew 4, 24, King James Version. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases. The old preacher stepped back and said, Now doctors can scrutinize you and analyze you and sometimes cure your ills, but when you have divers diseases, then only the Lord can heal you. And brethren, there is an epidemic of divers diseases among us. Some dive for the door when Sunday school is over. Some dive for their car and take trips on the weekends. Some dive into their pockets for nickels and dimes when the offering plate comes by. Some dive for their boat and head to the lake for the weekend. Some dive into excuses when asked to serve in a ministry of the church. Yes, there is an epidemic of divers' diseases among us, and only the Lord can heal divers' diseases. You see, we don't need an epidemic of divers' diseases to break out in this church. You need to be healed of diving for this, diving for that, because that's how you get your joy back. Finding joy calls for service. Does God seem distant from you this morning? Find a place. Serve your Lord. Does your 
joy not seem to be what it used to be? You, do you need your joy back? Find a place and serve your Lord. We have ministries here that, that will need staffing when we start back up in August with everything that we do during the school year from August to May. I want you to mark August the 3rd on your calendar. That's a Sunday morning. And on that morning, we're going to have a ministry fair where all of the ministries of our church will be represented. All of the ministries of our church will be on display. And you can go by and find a place to serve your Lord. Find a place to plug in this fall as we start back up with school, we start back up with Awanas and children's choirs and Wednesday night meals and adult choir and all the other things that go on as the summertime draws to a close and we start back up. We'll need you to plug in to a place of ministry. Find a place and serve. And then joy will return to your life. Look again at verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Look at that phrase. Sinners will return to you. Never underestimate what the Lord can do through you. Never think that you don't have anything to share. Never think that you don't have anything to contribute or that nobody can learn from you. Not at all. You could be the very instrument God uses to touch another person's life. You could be the very instrument that God uses to turn the life of a teenager or a child around. You could be that very, that very instrument. Look at those phrases in verse 14 and 15. My tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. My mouth will will declare your praise. You see, finding joy calls for service. But it doesn't have to be in a formal ministry. Your service can just be in the course of your everyday activities. Those phrases that I read, your tongue singing aloud of God's righteousness, your mouth declaring God's praise, they speak of just taking the natural opportunities that arise every day to speak a word about your Lord. Those phrases speak of just the natural opportunities that come your way just in the normal course of your life to speak a word about your Lord. You serve Him when you tell others about Him, when you praise His name. Finding joy calls for service. But that's not complete. Something needs to be added to that statement. Something I said earlier we'd come back to. We serve not in order to receive forgiveness, but because we have already been forgiven. Look at verse 16 and 17. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So here's how we've got to complete our life point this morning. Finding joy calls for service flowing from a yielded life. Now, look again at verses 16 and 17. Something dawned on David, which is pretty good for an Old Testament guy. Something dawned on David out of this whole experience with Bathsheba and Uriah and Nathan coming to him and saying, you are the man that has sinned against God. Something dawned on David out of this whole experience and it concerned the subject of sacrifices. And we have to learn the same truth. How many times, I wonder, did David go to the temple after committing adultery with Bathsheba and after committing murder of of Uriah, I I wonder how many times he went to the temple and, and had a lamb slain, a bull slain, a goat slain on an altar, thinking that was going to take away the sin he had committed. I feel like there was something still in his heart he knew this, this is not it. This is not what God wants from me. God, God doesn't want the bull slain on the altar. God doesn't want the lamb slain on the altar. There's a thousand lambs I could slay on the altar. That's not what God wants. And it dawned on him. It dawned on him. God desires me on the altar, not an animal. God wants my life on the altar, 
not a lamb, and not a bull, ram, not a bull, not a, not a goat. That's not what God desires. He wants me on the altar. That's what dawned on David. That's the truth that he learned, and it's the same truth you and I must learn. God wants you on the altar. He wants your yielded life. You see, David saw it before Paul did. Do you remember Paul's words to the Roman believers in chapter 12? Paul writes to those Roman believers in chapter 12, verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. David saw it before Paul did. It's not the blood of a, of a bull. It's not the lamb that he wants on an altar. It's our life that God wants on an altar. In other words, you give your bodies to God. You let them be a living sacrifice, and that is the kind of offering that God accepts. What pleases God, the sacrifice he wants, are broken, contrite, a life yielded to Him. And it is then out of that yielded life that your service flows. It is then out of that life that is yielded to Him that you serve the Lord. Finding joy calls for service. Flowing from a yielded life. And out of that yielded life, your service to God comes, and your joy comes back. You see, it's not the sacrifice of you showing up here every Sunday and filling the pew that the Lord wants. It's not you gritting your teeth and giving your tithe every Sunday that the Lord wants. No. It's not you surrendering out of guilt when somebody asks you to do something that the Lord wants? Okay, I'll do it. No. The Lord wants a yielded life out from which service naturally comes. Duty says I ought to. I ought to do that. I'll do my duty. I'll hate it. But I'll do it. Duty says I ought to do it. Devotion says I want to do it. A yielded life says I want to do it. And it is out of that yielded life that your service flows. And it is that kind of life that finds joy. Devotion first, then service. God desires from you a life that is yielded to Him more than He desires your attendance here every Sunday, your tithe every month, and your teaching every week. Because if you have a devoted heart and life, you will willingly and joyfully give the rest. You will willingly and joyfully give your time, your tithe, your talents, you will willingly and joyfully give them because you have a life yielded to Him. But without a yielded life, all those other things, your time, your talent, your tithe, they're just burnt offerings, folks. They're just burnt offerings. And God is not pleased with them. And you will not find joy in giving them. Finding joy calls for service flowing from a yielded life. What a song. It teaches us how to get our joy back. David didn't say, restore to me my salvation. He'd never lost his relationship with the Lord. He said, restore to me the joy of your salvation, Lord. It's a psalm that teaches us how to get our joy back and how to be close to God again. 
I struggled with how to conclude the message. Then I decided I'd just let somebody else do it for me. Somebody that I listened to when I was a 20-something, 30-something. Somebody who left us all too soon. Somebody whose music I miss. Listen to these words because they crystallize what I've been trying to say to you this morning. And all you who grew up in the 70s and 80s will remember this guy. I don't need your money, I want your life, and I hear you say that I'm coming back soon, but you act like I'll never return. You thrive on milk, but reject my meat, and I can't help weeping at how it will be if you keep on ignoring my word. Well, you pray to prosper. The flesh is something I just can't see. To obey is better than sacrifice. I want. Finding joy calls for service flowing from a yielded life. Would you take time every day this week, every day this week, would you find time and read again this 51st Psalm? Read it every day this week and apply its truths to your life. And your joy will come back. Let's pray. Father, teach us the lesson that David learned. Teach us the principle that dawned on David, Father. Teach us that what you desire is a yielded life. Us on the altar. And from that yielded life, Father, our service to you flows. 
our service of obedience to you flows naturally. And joy returns to our life. And so, Father, I pray for believers today who've been gritting their teeth serving you. Who have surrendered and said, okay, I'll do it because that was what they thought their duty was. I pray that you'll change their hearts, create in them a clean heart where it's not duty, but it's devotion. First to you, and then their service will come naturally, and joy will track them down, jump in their hip pocket and follow them around every day. Father, I pray that you would return, restore to many here today the joy of your salvation. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. In a moment we'll stand and sing. We always stand and sing. In fact, those words just roll off my tongue. We're going to stand and sing. But it's important. In fact, it's the most important few minutes of the whole hour. Because people need to respond to the message. People need to respond to what God has said. In some way, every Sunday, you need to respond. Now that response may be, okay, Lord, I'm going to stand here and you've spoken to me and I know what I need to do. And you go out the door in just a few minutes and you do it. Wonderful. I remember the first sermon I ever preached. Somebody that hadn't heard it asked somebody that did hear it, how was Pepper's sermon? They said, well, it's pretty good. The guy said, did it change your life? The person that heard said, no, I don't think it changed my life, but it was, it was good. Every sermon ought to change your life. In some way, in some aspect, some portion, some part of your life ought to be shifted, changed. Not because Pepper's sermons are good, but because God spoke to you. And that's why we stand and sing. To give you an opportunity to respond to what you've heard. And for many of you, it's just okay in the quietness of your heart and in the moment. Yes, Lord, I heard you today. And that's where I'm going to change. Wonderful. It's what I pray for every morning. But some need to make a public response. Because there's something about coming to an altar and getting on your knees and say, God, I heard you today, and I don't want to keep living like I'm living. And I need to change that and that and that. I need to change. And by your power and in your grace, I will. And you get up and you go back to your seat. And Monday morning, when you start to slide back into that same old habit, you say, nope. I'm not going to do that because yesterday morning went down, I knelt and I got it right and, and, and the Lord and I, we nailed it down in my life. I'm changing. That's why we ask you to come and kneel. Some of you want to join the church today. You don't have to walk down an aisle. I can't find that in this book. To join a church, walk down an aisle and shake the preacher's hand. It's not here. But it is a custom that works, and it's one of the ways that you can join our church. We gladly welcome you today. So if you're here and you're not a member of First Baptist Church, and you want to be, 
when we stand and sing in just a moment, you come down an aisle. We'll, we'll, we'll gladly welcome you into our fellowship. You can join our church this morning during this time. And then we always give an opportunity for those of you that don't know Christ to come. To come. Because there's a, the Spirit of God has got a hold of your heart and your life and, and He's not going to let you go. And that's what you're feeling right now. It is the convicting power of the Spirit who says you need to go and publicly confess Christ. You need to go and tell them you want the Lord Jesus into your life and heart. You believe that He died on the cross for your sins and you're going to confess sin and you're going to accept Him into your life. And we do it every Sunday. Because I never know when the Holy Spirit's got a hold of your heart. I'm not omniscient. I never know who's here. This this may be the only Sunday you've been here in the last eight weeks. It may be your first Sunday here. But today's the day. As I shared with you a couple of weeks ago. Here, let me show you the promise that says you have tomorrow. I think Paul wrote about that in Ephesians. No, it was Jesus who said that in John. No, wait a minute. That was the prophet Isaiah. No, you can look all over this book. It's got a thousand promises, but there's not one of them that guarantees you tomorrow. And so we give an invitation every Sunday because I never know what the Spirit of God is up to out there. And so there are some of you seated right now that in a moment when we stand, you need to come and give your life to Christ. You need to come and trust the Lord as the Savior of your life. So next Sunday morning, after I get through with the prayer and I say, in a moment, we're going to stand and sing. It's not because, well, that's just the way we end our services. It's crucial and vital to the whole morning. Let's stand. Let's stand. We're going to sing. We're going to sing. If you need to come down an aisle, you come. If you need to come to this altar, you come.